Welcome, welcome to Flat Earth Philosophy. I'm just going to talk about some physics today and how um, a lot of it is basically null and void once you realise what's actually happening up there. This is what physics is all about, what's happening up there with the celestial bodies and it's all hoo-ha. I'm about to explain why. Kepler's law of motion e.g. ellipses, this is associated with Newton's law of universal gravity as well, uh, force, mass and acceleration, dimensions in space, circular motion, inverse square law. And uh, then we'll touch on general relativity, <coughs> which is basically... Um, Vacuum energy, dark force, cosmological constant, accelerated expansion of the universe. Curving linear, coordinate transformation. Einstein knew that there was a connection between gravity and curvy linear coordinates. Transformation of space-time, special relativity, centrifugal and Coriolis. Space-time curvature is the toroidal field over the Earth. All that general relativity. It's all about the Earth's curving magnetic field over Earth, the moving toroidal field. It's toroidal field. They know the magnetic field curves. You follow it with a compass, you're going to curve. You're going to do a curved path across the Earth from north to south. That's why we have gyros now, because they do all the calculations. Well, that's why they need the ca calculators. They calculate the trips before they leave. Because it's all set up. The gyro is set to avoid that curve following that magnetic field. They'll just do a straight A to B trip. That's general relativity. They should just come out and explain to their teenagers or the children, the kids learning this stuff, sitting there listening to hour after hour of all this garbage when all they're referring to is the toroidal field. Draw them a toroidal field and show them how it works. Then they'll understand the entire system with a flat plane of Earth in the middle. The state of inertia. It's come from the plane of inertia. What's the plane of inertia? The plane of inertia is in the dielectric. Uh, it's equilibrium, the state of rest, and all the actions around it. So you've got the dielectric like in capacitance, capacitor, the dielectric plate, the two fields at the magnetic field out here, avoiding the dielectric. They come to the cliff, head, cliff face, drop down, and go like this. That's the infinity symbol of the snake. Down, up to there, back over, down that cliff face, around, up and down this cliff face. They do not meet the dielectric plate. All the energy comes up, builds up, and shoots down this way to get to the other field. This one goes that way. Because this is what magnetism is. I'm about to do a world first video on what actually magnetism is. No one's ever done it. Ken Wheel has come that, that close, but he still hasn't described it fully. He's saying he's the only one who can describe it, but no, I can describe it. So the magnetic field comes up, shoots down, finds equilibrium. Because that's that's what the magnetic field is doing, finding equilibrium. That's why you have a magnetic, a constant magnetic field. It never finds rest. If the fields were equal, they would find rest. There'd be no magnetic field anymore. They find rest. That's what the dielectric is. That's where the plane of inertia is created, from the place of rest. So you've got the place of rest, but you have all the action around the outside. So you have the place of rest, which is Earth, and then you have the moving toroidal field all around it. And our celestial bodies are in there. 
the intelligible and the metaphysical, well, sorry, the intelligible and the metaphysical on this side, the common folk don't understand, but it's quite well explained in Plato. And then you have the, the obvious, the visual, the observed. This is what that previous video was about in Plato's dialogue, um, The Republic, 509 to 511, describing it quite well. How we see the celestial bodies, or the, the uh, sun, etc., in the tropical zone. Yet I've done previous videos explaining how it works over the entire Earth. The sun's an lemma, the magnetic field. The sun follows the magnetic field. That's in science. So that big sun and a lemma, it goes right up around the north, back down, crosses over it cancer there, out around the south and back up again. That's how it all works. <clears throat> now, Kepler's law of motion and all that, all hoo-ha, you know why? Well, I'm about to show you. And still re retrograde as well. What they don't understand is the sun moves around the horizon of the black hole. They don't even know the sun's on the horizon of the black hole. I don't think they do yet. So they've got the black hole. They talk about the black hole a lot. The horizon of the black hole. They don't talk of the sun being on its horizon. So the sun's moving around the black hole. What's outside the black hole? It's the ecliptic plane. All the planets are moving around in their cycles. They don't speed up or slow down. They all have their set cycles. As you come out from the center, as you come out from the black hole, you have the racetrack. It's circular. It's not elliptical. It's not an ellipse. Planets don't do an ellipse. They do a circle. Now the sun is in there. The sun is in that circle. On that circle, it moves in that circle as well. But it's inside the track. And all the energy comes out from the center. Expands out. This is the toroidal field of Earth. It expands out. This is the azimuthal equidistant we get in the toroidal field. Why the Gleason Flat Earth map is expanding out. Doesn't mean that the wider distances here and the longitude is any different to the time back here. And this all comes into general relativity. Time and distance and curvature and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, so the sun's in here doing a circle too, a small circle. See, Polaris does a little circle because Polaris is the sun. Sigma Octantis does a little circle because Sigma Octantis is a mirror image of Polaris. But it's exploded because it's out in the expansion. So they see, you see more detail, if you can zoom in, the Sigma Octantis, several more bodies. It's exploded more. Well, that's fainter because the weaker force in total. It is, it is expanded out. So the stars you'll see close to Sigma Octantis have come out and you'll see them. I think there are three bodies in there somewhere. But they don't see them back at Polaris. So they laugh at you when you tell them it's a reflection of Polaris because they look different. See, people aren't bright enough to realize they're the same, but they're obviously going to look different because an expanded view. When it comes to these uh, uh, constellations, they'll be different. But that's, a, that's another story. But the uh, background stars and all that, they're the same, just seen differently in the different field, the weaker, more dispersed field. Anyway, back to the sun in the smaller circle, and the planets going around out here. So, Let's say that the sun's moving, right? The sun is moving. So imagine this picture. So the planet's moving this way. Everything moves in the same direction. There's only one central vortex that runs the entire creation, our whole realm. So the planet's moving this way, right? And the planet's, the sun has got more energy because it's in the center. All the energy, the strongest energy. This is blue shift into the center. Red shift's coming out. Weaker, weaker field. So the sun has more energy, so it's going to do its circuit way quicker than the planets. So, that, so the planet's moving along, and around comes the sun. 
And now once they start seeing the sun in such a, such a position and it's catching up to the planet, they're not telling you or assuming that the sun is moving. So they're saying the planet starts moving this way in the retrograde, right? The sun's catching up. So they're saying the planet's going up to the sun, going towards the sun. When all along it's the sun catching up to the planet. So when the sun gets to here and hides the planet, and then the sun passes it, instead of the sun passing it moving this way, they want you to believe that the planet is going back this way. And when the sun gets away far enough, all of a sudden the planet starts going this way again. That's what they call retrograde. Complete garbage. But now they say it's all, all optical, it's an illusion, but they don't, still don't understand it's the sun going like this, just passing it. So all these Kepler's, all the stuff is all irrelevant. It's all done and void. It's just rubbish. They'll spend hours and hours sitting in a classroom talking to your children, spilling all this crap. And then you've got general relativity, the, magne the toroidal field of Earth. Understand that. It'll, the ki it'll sink into the kid's mind straight away. It's simple. But you sit listening to this guy. He's not as dumb as the rest, though. This, this guy, Leonard Sask Saskin, because he, like, he, he doesn't like to admit that the section um, celestial bodies are doing ellipses. He says they could be doing circles. All they have to do is understand what the sun's doing. That little rotation. But it starts ruining all their spinning ball theory, doesn't it? So they can't fully explain it properly, otherwise they're going to flip back to the flat earth. Reality, what it was always known as. Then we've got, some people touch on this big rip theory. Expands with time. Look at all the universe expanding with time. So they're touching on the fact that it does expand outward, but they think it's going to carry on and rip away from the, the strong central force. No. So they're, they're starting to understand, or they should understand, it is expanding out, but that's just the southern field. That's the, the weaker force, because everything's governed by a magnetic field, a magnetic, magnetic force. And it has to have a strong force and a weak force. There's always going to be a strong force at the center and the tight choke point, center of convergence, and the expansion out here. The strong force and the weak force, the weak force is always going to have to, it's going to want to seek equilibrium, race to the strong force. And the strong force is always going to race to the weak force. There's always a bigger field out there. And there's the cosmological constant of the toroidal field always moving expanding out from its center out from the hyperboloid center it's the cosmological cent constant what else he's talking about so as I was stating years ago vacuum energy dark force cosmological constant accelerated expansion of the universe it's all the one thing the toroidal field all associated with general relativity. And general relativity comes into, uh, what have we got? Didn't make a note of that one. What have we got here? Um, well, basically, frame of reference relative to the observer. It's all space time curvature, special relativity. Frame, it's all to do with frame of reference because. As it expands out, cosmological constant expands out, that is all relative to the observer out there in the south. So they're expanded in the field, actually, if you can get your head around that. There were giants in those days. There's probably the association with that in the Bible. It comes back to, you shrink back to the center and expand out. As the field expands, every living thing expands in that field. You're expanding with the field, so there's no there's no variance in travel time between A and B here and 
So A and B out here. We've expanded with it. This is what people can't get their head around. Why it takes just as much time to travel from A to B up here around England, across to the States or whatever, as it is to fly from South America to New Zealand. It's all there. So that's one thing you have to understand. So the Gleason map it might be it mightn't be perfect because you also have to bear in mind the curving magnetic fields. Travelling in that curved field with a compass, are, are they distributed properly around the flat earth, those continents, land masses? They could be slightly out. And I've drawn, uh, I've worked on the globe and the flat map to, to work things out with time, times, time zones, running these curves, <coughs> things like that. But uh, there's nothing wrong with the uh, Gleason map, really, if you understand that everything expands outwards and time is similar to here. Um, so if you're travelling on a direct meridian from north to south, you don't have a problem. But as soon as you start veering off east or west, things start changing in, in time because... Uh, well, time has got to do with the latitudes, the further you go south. And if you, as soon as you start veering off east or west, then things start changing. This is why you need the computer system. They computerise their aeroplane trips before they leave. This is why pilots, they don't get to understand all that stuff. No, it's all secretive stuff. Back at Boeing, you know, it's all connected with NASA, the military. All secretive stuff. GPS. All to do with coordinates, that's what general, relativ uh, yeah, general relativity is. Curv curving linear coordinates, transformation of space-time. We call it space-time. Not, you're not out there in la-la land. It's just the divergence of the Earth's magnetic field. This is why we get corrections and, and sailing and, and all that. You've got to make corrections for that curvature where you're following with a compass, the rum lines and stuff. But if you've got a gyro, the modern gyros on board, it's all set up before you leave. You just follow that gyro all the way, A to B, without crashing into an island. So that was basically that video. Physics, eh? Now, watch out for my next video because, because I'm going to make it quite easy. I'm going to explain what gravity really is. No one's ever told it. No one's ever explained it. It's so basic. Watch out for that one. Cheers, guys. Thumbs up. Share.